our next talk will be by TQ, Calvin, and Tech Fury, um, which would have been far more difficult actually if we would have met in Leipzig, because um, TQ is originally from the US, now he lives in Bel Belgium. Calvin is from Canada, and Tech Fury is from the US. So this would, be, would have been far more difficult to do in person. TQ um, it has been into, into retro computing for around 20 years, starting with the TRS-80, moving over to mini computers, and yeah, he's especially interested in the features that died with that market segment. Kelvin from Canada um, started re retro computing also as a an hobby, and he lives the dream of most of us because he got to make a job out, out of it. So he works with the more modern iterations of uh, the systems he started out with a as a hobby. And Tech Fury um, is a daytime shipment tracking software developer and a nighttime necromancer for weird old hardware. And uh, together, the three will talk to us about what have we lost, um, features of mainframes, and so on. Good evening, everyone. Let's talk about some fun old shit you can learn from at home. Your hosts tonight are Calvin Buckley. Hi. I basically, on my day job, I just basically do a whole bunch of PHP hacking on IBM I. Spoiler alert, we're going to be talking about that. And at night, I basically enjoy preserving software for future generations. Apparently, there's also this guy called TQ. Hi. I by day I build distributed or I build a distributed trust system for computers. And at night I figure out how to make computers or how to make old computers feel comfortable in a modern world. And there's also Landon. In my day job I maintain an in-house iOS app. And at night I'm a curator and aficionado of bygone Japanese and British computer systems, you know, like NEC, PC ninety eights, Acorn Archimedes, etc. And with that being said, let's hand off to TQ with his uh, presentation on the Symbolics Lisp machine. So, in the early 80s, MIT spun off part of its research group into a firm that produced Lisp machines. Uh, that firm was called Symbolics. They built a machine called the Symbolics 3600 that ran an operating system called Genera. What exactly was this? Uh, well, obviously, based on the name, it's a Lisp machine. It's a it's got hardware that runs Lisp directly. Uh, the, everything that ran on the machine was written in Lisp, from the microcode to the operating system, all of the drivers, everything. Uh, it included all of your development tools that you'd expect. Uh, so or the editors, or your editor, your compiler, your debuggers, inspectors to be able to look at data structures, all in Lisp. Uh, and it was, for a very long time, considered to be one of the best development environments around. It ended up dying as sort of ignoble death because, for a combination of reasons. First of all, the company made some absolutely terrible decisions. Uh, they ported their platform to run on Nubus on Macintosh shortly before Apple switched to PowerPC and PCI, er, and PCI, and then they went from there to the architecture of the future, Alpha, and then they died. We're not here to talk about the death of Symbolics, we're here to talk about their life. Uh, let's talk about their first machine, the 3600. Shipped in 1983, uh, it had a 36-bit word, four bits of which were set aside for tag bits to tell what type of data was stored in a particular word. Uh, and the other 32 bits were for the value of that particular word. Uh, the processor microcode had 36... Er, the processor microcode had up to 16 hardware tasks to be able to handle things like interfacing with the disks, driving the display, 
scanning the keyboard, accessing the network, etc. Uh, that microcode also provided a high-level instruction set that had instructions like cons to allocate memory and garbage collect if necessary. Uh, it also had your usual complement of arithmetic instructions, add, subtract, etc. But unlike most architectures, even modern architectures, the arithmetic instructions operated on un arbitrary precision words, even possibly rational numbers. Uh, at one point, they ported a C compiler to it. It just used the native machine integers, because why not? And somebody tried to run a program that determined the size of the word by shifting one left until it ran off the end. And this program ra ran for about an hour until it ran out of memory. <laughs> so, uh, I could explain the inter I could explain the interface, but it's probably easiest to start with a demo. When you start up Genera, you're greeted by a pretty high-resolution graphics display. The original machines shipped with an 1100 by 900 resolution screen, so this full HD display that you're seeing right now is not far off from original hardware. With so many pixels to play with, it may actually be surprising that the entire dis display is taken up by a command line. But this is not the Unix command line that you're used to. Uh, we'll start by logging in. That's what it tells us to do. And immediately we see that there's a significant difference. Normally with a Unix command line, you start by, you type in a command, cp, ls, whatever, and it just waits for you to type in the rest of the command. If you need to give parameters, you need to already know what those parameters are, possibly looking them up in a man page. Genera, on the other hand, Genera holds your hand a bit more and prompts you. You need to enter a username. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, so what can we do here? As any Unix user knows, the first thing that you do in any terminal, whether or not, or whether you've just changed the directory or whatever, the first thing you do is list the, or is do ls. Genera spells it a bit differently. And I'm going to list my home directory, which hopefully is already selected. This still looks very much like a traditional Unix directory listing. But you'll notice that as I mouse over it, you, it actually highlights individual lines. And this is the first hint that there's something really special going on. Suppose that I want to list the contents of one of these directories. Uh, I'll type in show directory. You'll notice actually that I just typed in the first couple characters and it auto completed. I want to list, list the lisp directory. And I could type it, but it's already on screen. I should be able to just click it. And when I do, it pastes it into the prompt, and I can hit enter to accept it. That just lists, lists the directory itself, which is not quite ideal. I wonder what else we can do. What happens if you just click it directly? That actually lists the contents. And you'll notice that it actually filled in a command for me. It says show directory genera vlm home the quox lisp slash star. What has actually happened here is very subtle. Each of these objects that is shown on screen has a set of handlers attached to them. And when I click on them, it's best the system knows a command that should get run. Such a command could be bound to the left mouse button, which is what you'd expect. It might be bound to the right mouse button. In fact, at the bottom of the screen here, you can see, well, I can't actually point it out, but you can see that if I press the left mouse button, it will execute show file. If I execute the right mouse button, it will show a menu. And there's a bunch of other commands. So now that I've shown the contents of the Lisp directory, let's say that I want to actually show what is in a file. Just type in show file. And we'll get to these files later. For now, let's just look at this file one and file two. Paste file one, and it shows the contents. It says no need to get caddy, which makes sense. 
but this is basically the equivalent of cat. I could have done the same thing by just clicking that without typing in, in the command first. I have other options too. I can open up an editor. I'm going to resize the current window. And open an editor and move that aside so that I can see the window underneath. This is Emacs. As you can probably guess from the name, it's just an Emacs clone. The Z actually stands for Zwei, which stands, or which in turn stands for Zwei was Ina initially. And in case you're curious what Ina stood for, Ina is not Emacs. It's all a good pun. Being an Emacs clone, we can open a file with Control X, Control F. We know that we want to look at file one, so we can click it, and it opens. Earlier, we, we clicked file one and it, and it printed it down below. If the active window is, in, is a CMAX window, though, we can click another file and instead of printing it in, in the Lisp listener, it opens it. This shows that each window has an input context associated with it, and the input context controls what commands will, will be automatically executed when you select or interact with some object that's on the screen. I'd like to point out one more feature of the command line. I remember reading that Lisp was widely seen as the language to implement advanced AIs in, and I decided that I didn't care to actually write this talk. I, I wanted the system to do it for me. It's Lisp. It's good at that. So I made a command. And it asks me what I want to give a talk on. I'm giving a talk on Genera for now. I click that, and it asks me a couple more questions. Do I want to talk about presentations? Yes. Do I want to talk about the inspector? Yeah, I might have time. Let's see. Ooh, what do I want to inspect? I can click hit this and type in a function, the results of which will show me later. I'll skip that for now, because chances are we'll have enough to talk about that I won't actually have time to get into that. Do I want to talk about documentation? Yes. Cool. Let's do that. And as it turns out, I didn't have, actually have time to make an AI to write the talk for me, so well, well. So let's take a look at what the code that created that looks like. Here's the source code. All I did is I declared a couple of variables. I called the accepting values function and then asked a series of questions. Some of the quest or whether some of the questions got asked depends on the answers to some of the earlier questions. You may recognize this pattern. This is exactly the same way that you'd write code for React or Dear I am I am GUI or any of the many modern immediate mode GUI frameworks. What have we learned? Uh, interesting things that you saw there that you should really keep keep in mind. That the things that you should remember from that demo are that Genera had a pervasive command line interface that integrated very, very well with the, gra or with the graphical interface, uh, and that everything that got displayed on screen represented an actual object, and you could manipulate those objects based on the things that appeared on the screen. Let's look at an alternative implementation of the same idea, just from the West Coast. Lando? And on the West Coast, Xerox actually invented its own sort of Lisp machine. They uh, originally ported BBN's Lisp for the PDP-10 as people moved over to Park from the East Coast, you know, who used to work at BBN MIT. Then they ported it to the Alto at Park using a bytecode virtual machine implemented in the Alto microcode. Then it got ported to the successors, the D machines, which they called because they had names starting with the letter D, you know, Dandelion, Dorado, Daybreak so on and so forth. And since the IntraLisp D team was near the Smalltalk team, many of Smalltalk's concepts like overlapping windows made their way into IntraLisp D. And as happened with Symbolics, IntraLisp D was also the victim of the AI winter, and it never really thrived after Xerox sold it off in 88, but recently Xerox has open sourced it. Now, since the D machines were actually originally meant to run Xerox's Mesa virtual machine, and they kind of just hacked IntraLisp onto them, 
they're more or less just a simple 16-bit microcode stack machine. You know, not really that different from a lot of 70s mini computers, just kind of in a workstation form factor. So they aren't as fast. There's a lot less fancy features. You know, none of these fancy tagged pointers, none of that. But it worked, and it was a lot cheaper than Symbolics. Eventually, a team at Fuji Xerox actually implements this virtual machine in C on top of Sun OS. And it's actually now open source, and you can run it on your common x86 ARM whatnot system today. Just get it off GitHub. So just like East Coast Lisp machines, Interlisp D is also a complete operating system, again, written entirely in Lisp. However, there's no Emacs for the editor. It's a little bit different on Interlisp. Interlisp's S edit text, or I'm sorry, code editor, works by editing S expressions directly in memory. It's not a text editor. It does not touch source files on disk at all. You just merely edit your S expressions directly in memory and then just hit done, and it automatically commits the changes in memory, but it requires a further step to save them. And also, Interlisp D provides T edit, which is a rich text editor that was inspired by the famous Bravo editor on the Alto. And now, let's see Interlisp D for ourselves. Let's start up Interlisp D. You can try this at home. Everything I'm about to show you can be done with just the materials on GitHub. As you can see, this is a bit more like Smalltalk than Genera in terms of aesthetics. We have draggable and resizable windows, just like modern windowing systems. We also have right-click context menus. They've been around a while. Now, note that this environment looks more or less the same as Interlisp D did in the 80s. They haven't changed a whole, whole lot. So anyway, in the exec menu, we can pull up a REPL. We have Xerox Common Lisp, a strict Common Lisp mode, and we have Interlisp. So let's pull up an Interlisp REPL. All right, so let's customize our environment a little bit. This background's kind of plain. So we're going to use Files Load, star BG to load in a program called star BG but we don't know what the name of the function we need to call is. But we do know that there's a variable called the star BG comms, and that's kind of like a package manifest where all the uh, variables and functions are grouped together. So what we can do is we can pull up the editor on star BG comms. Now this is sedit. Sedit's a little interesting, as I mentioned earlier. This is not a text editor. This editor is actually editing the S expressions directly in memory and formatting them as code. So the nice thing about this is that the uh, we change the size of it. As you can see, the code automatically is formatted to fit the different sizes. Now, let's look at our functions down here. See, it's in the function section. Again, notice as I double-click on things, the scope expands. I thought that was pretty cool. So, let's see, star BG, this looks similar. So we'll select that, see how it's underlined, and then we will middle click on the menu bar here. We can choose Edit, Functions, and take a look at that. That's the function, star VG's code. Now let's run it. And you see we have this nice little space themed background. Now let's do a little bit of editing. This is a little bit of a famous demo here, sort of. You see this a lot in old brochures, and why is the mouse being very laggy today? It's kind of strange. Famous has the Interlisp D logo. But I think we should change some things about. So why don't we, uh, since we know we called Koto logo W, the function, we'll do DF to find function, which also edits. Koto logo W. Now, we could just simply use some of the arguments, such as a string, but, you know, let's just hack it. So we're going to change the interlist B. Hi, RC3. And we're going to go to the S edit menu. We're going to choose done. This commits the changes, but only in memory. So it has not changed the file that's loaded from. Let's run the logo again. Hey, look at that. Hi, RC3. Now, so that, like I said, it doesn't save them to disk. So if we do files, question mark, 
it notices that we've made changes to the Koto logo W function in the Koto logo file. And if we do make files, we've now saved it. And we can also try this. Let's see how this works with the new function. Let's try df hello. We're going to do a little bit of a hello world function. We can do this old school enter list style. So we're going to use lambda. See, the template's already filled out. We're going to highlight this argument. And then we're just going to hit backward delete, or I'm sorry, forward delete. And then see how that's cleared out. And we'll do the same here. Notice when I type the closing parent, it just simply closes it. It doesn't insert anything. I can't just type more. And this is very structured, this editor. You do done. Now we have our hello world function. And if we do files question mark again, it's going to ask where we would like to put it. So, oh, it's beeping at me because it's a yes or no question. They do a lot of things like this in Entrelip. So we'll just hit Y. And we'll give it a name, hello2, create a new file. And you can see the changes are marked in there. It's already created a hello2coms. Let's take a look at that. So you can see it's already built a package with just the function hello, which is the same hello as we see there, as we will see when I pull up edit. Same thing. So. Moving on further from that, you can also do to save it, make files, and we can also explicitly do that with make file. Again, and notice there's a version number. This is inherited from TOPS20, which is uh, what they ran this on originally before they poured it to the D machines. Now let's take a look at the tedit document editor and the uh, file browser. So if we right click on here, we can choose the file browser. And we're going to give it medley. Notice the use of the greater than symbol for the path separator. So all right, we're going to take a look here. Table of contents. This is the Lisp users library. This is basically a contributed programs from users. So we select it like such there with the left button. We're going to go to edit, t-edit, ask us to define our window. See, take a look at this. This is a t-edit, rich text editor, kind of getting a little bit of a uh, generic document examiner vibe here almost. And it's in fact a complete rich text editor. Let me see if I can get the, here we go, expanded menu. Page layout stuff. You can also quit it. Close that window. And similarly, most of these entries, like say star BG, we were looking at just a little bit ago. Let's find that. Similarly, it has its documentation available through here. Now, similarly, we also have a uh, language reference manual available through dinfo, and that too also appears to be based upon tedit. Let's go ahead and actually close tedit there. All right. See, so you can navigate through this. It's all hypertext style. And then, ah, we almost forgot about Dwim. Dwim is pretty cool. Dwim is do what I mean. And so remember how we typed hello, and that has to be in all caps because Lisp is case sensitive in this regard. But let's see what happens if I type it all lowercase. It suggests for me automatically that perhaps I meant all uppercase, or I could tell it it's wrong, undefined function. And similarly, as you might expect from a virtual machine, virtual memory persistent setup, you can also simply log out just got dwimmed again to all caps and then that will save the entire world and we can pull it back up again just exactly where we were
And that's it for the Interlisp D demo. And now we will go on to our next and last platform I will be demonstrating today, Btron. Japan's attempt to design their own desktop operating system from scratch. But what is Btron? It's an outgrowth of the Tron project, which basically was a Japanese academ academia initi industry initiative to develop a new set of operating systems and standards for a computerized society of the 21st century. And they came up with all sorts of standards like the Tron keyboard, they even had CPU architecture, the end goal of all this was to have essentially a world in which all of the objects in your everyday life would be based on iTron embedded operating systems interlinked through a network of Ctron machines to your, your Btron based desktop computer. And so Btron is known as Businesstron. It has a desktop metaphor, it's meant for personal computers, it has a heavy emphasis on working with documents. And one implementation of it is still sold today as a VMware image. And speaking of these uh, futuristic systems that sound awfully like the Internet of Things, I highly recommend watching this Tron Smart House video I've linked here. We couldn't fit it in here. There wasn't enough time. But you will see that the Internet of Things is really nothing new as a concept and that these guys even thought as far as the Internet of Things toilet back in the day. <laughs> So one of the unique features of Btron is the Tron application data bus, which defines real objects and virtual objects. Real objects are a type of structured container file. They can contain any number of embedded virtual objects or links to other virtual objects within other real objects. Btron additionally calls for a unified document editor in which various basic objects can be freely mixed and embedded. For instance, you can actually use an embedded spreadsheet object as a table, and system updates actually are shipped as documents. And speaking of system updates shipped as documents, we're going to actually show you how to install one right now in this demo, right now. All right, so I fired up Chokan GV here. This is the virtual machine VMware version. Does not need any special hardware or anything. So first we need to put this in English. So to do that, we're going to open up a web browser. It's actually a document or plugin. Go ahead and get to the support page. Find the Chokan GV English kit. I'll download it. Tell it to save it as an archive file. Okay, and then we open it and we'll drag the uh, document out. So now we've created the real object containing the uh, English patch and we'll open it up. It's actually a variety of virtual objects inside. See, I'm double clicking on them. It's very hypertext like. I'm going to installation. And if you can see right here, the update is actually a blob within the uh, document. So we'll go ahead and go to System Setup, Version tab, drag it in here. Once this to reboot, we'll go ahead and do that. All right, and then we'll open the document again. Actually, before we do that, we need to switch the language to English. Another reboot. Okay, now we're in English. We'll open this back up again. And what we can do here is if we... Actually, here's an even cooler way of doing this. And right-click on it here, go to Real Object, Virtual Object Network. Ah! You can actually see the structure of all the virtual objects within this document. So if we see this right here, we can do Copy to Tray, and then Copy from Tray. I guess the tray is what they call the clipboard. And let's see, let's open up a text pad, kind of like a basic document. All right, so. How about, let's put our English patch inside this document here. <laughs> As you can see, it's even been moved out of there. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's open up a drawing. 
Have some funny little shapes. You can just you can either I can save it to a new real object or the original. And we can actually draw it, drop it right in here, which I thought was pretty cool. But you can also You can also embed individual objects from within there. So those are also embeddable because, again, it's the same document editor. But here is what I thought was really strange. Let's open that web browser again. Let's take this back out. Now we can save as a TAD file. And we do that, and look at that. There's our object right there. We can just plop it right in here. And then if we go to, let's see here, let's save this first. And if we go to the same real object, do the virtual object network, you'll actually find that when we save the web page as a TAD file, it actually preserved every hyperlink, but each hyperlink is actually a virtual object. I thought that was rather interesting and fascinating. I had never really seen anything like that from a system before. So that's all for the Btron demo. Hope you enjoyed. Hi. It's the last system we're going to be talking about today, and I actually like Btron, the only other one that's still sold today. Unlike many of its contemporaries, especially in the IBM mainframe world, it combines an easy to use interface with then cutting edge computer science innovations like capability security. If you haven't heard of IBM I, you've probably heard of it under one of its many former names. And sold to almost exclusively average and non-technical small to medium businesses, basically designed to be treated like an appliance. It runs on IBM's normal PowerPC server lineup. Before that, it used to run various kinds of custom PowerPC and its own even custom architecture boxes. There are no emulators for this, unfortunately. Real steel only. The weird thing about I is that it's outlived almost all of its contemporaries, and even the ones that have survived don't tend to have a healthy sneak system as I. Despite this, unless you work with your average small to medium businesses, you never ever really know I was a thing. <laughs> I was designed to be easy to learn. It's kind of it looks like MVS, COS, or 370 mainframes, but it's notoriously broke and hard to learn. A lot of the I feels like it looks similar to the MVS, but it files away the rough edges because they actually have the luxury of starting from scratch. The biggest change is how all the commands were made consistent. Everything is a mix of verbs and nouns and consistent vocabulary. You can just learn these, and from there, you can guess most commands. If you don't know the arguments to a command, or even the values that pass into an argument or whatever you see on screen, you can just press the F4 key. That'll bring up a form prompt, and where you can have all the options presented to you and even explained. It'll usually even generate the actual command to run, so you can use it both as a learning tool as a convenience. If you see something on the screen that you're unsure of, you can just press F1 and it'll show context sensitive help for anything under the cursor. As for how the F4 prompt works, it's because you're not really invoking the program directly. Instead, there are commands that provide a list of arguments with names, types, and other information in addition to the actual call to the program itself. Interestingly, the values from this get passed directly to argv. You can pass handle pointers, including buffers passed to your program, we'll come to that soon, integers, and floats in varaw. The actual interface is also unlike your typical character terminal. On the right side of the presentation there, you can see Wireshark showing a breakdown of the IP version of the 5250 protocol. It's actually based on setting updates to positions of a screen and fields so that the terminal knows where the editable parts are. While the user submits back only for parts that changed, it sounds a lot like your HTML web form. This means you don't have ANSI like fine grained control, but since the machine can make sense of what's given to it, it's easy to navigate by, by cursor. The first thing you'll notice about the interface is it's quite menu based by default. For example, we can navigate this way. You can as you notice, the bottom commands are also all consistent. Things like F3 for exit, F12 for cancel, and F4 for prompt, for example, are also consistent. You can also, if we highlight something on the screen and press F1, 
we'll get contact sensitive help. We can press F12 to exit out of that. We can also mention the command. Press F1 and it'll also start explaining commands and some of our options. So we hit F3 to exit here. And if we do an F1 here, you'll also notice that the help system is hypertext. If we press enter here when the cursor is there, there, we can navigate and then we can press F3 to exit. The difference between F3 and F12 is that basically F3 exits out of the screen entirely, where F12 will only exit out of one screen. So you see here, I pressed F3 that one time, but here I can just do an F12 and get out of there that way. You also notice that each link had a little triangle indicating that it was visited before. Next, we can run work active jobs and that'll show us a little bit more interesting screen. This tends to be sort of a, what they call a point and shoot interface in the mainframe world. And these work with commands pretty much work similarly. You get some options here. You can get F1 for an explanation. Of each option with the little detail view and so on. As well, you can also put in these options here. And you can fuss do things like delete or multiple files. In this case, we'll enter five to get to the work with screen. And we'll just hit enter here and kind of cancel out of that. But as you can see there, it can do multiple things at a single time. For a little bit more interesting screen, however, you might, you might want to shut down the system, but you don't know all the options for it. So what you can do here is you can press F4, and it'll show you an, an explanation of everything. And the context sensitive help here works too. You press F1 and on option, and it'll explain it for you. And as well, you can even F4 again to get more options available. And as you also saw, the vocabulary is also consistent. If we want to work with objects, in say the Advent 2020, this is TQ's library for his Advent to Code stuff and he's doing in COBOL. And the all there is just kind of a special option, almost kind, kind of like an atom except and behind the scenes it's all handles of strings. Scene is there, we can scroll through and again we get the same point to shoot interface. We can hit delete here. As you can see there, when we enter something where we shouldn't, that is, it's not a marked field, it'll just give us an error. What we can do is we can press the reset key in the simulator, control R, and then we can just space over anything we don't want here. So I'm not probably not going to delete these things, but as you can see here, if we press enter, it would delete the stuff there. But Eva would prompt, I'm going to be a nice person and not going to do that. So that's just kind of a quick overview of what the interface is like on these systems. Part of the appliance nature is that SQL is built in a system and even implemented at a kernel level. Despite that, it's basically built to the same premises of the rest of the system. The same record files that source code is stored in are used for SQL tables. A variety of rich hardware objects that aren't bags of bytes provide the basis for more complex objects. The interesting part is how you store and work with them. There is no traditional file system in the sense that hot data of a memory becomes cold data on your disk in a separate structure. Instead, all objects are stored in a single address space. Each object has an address that persists even on reboot. If it data isn't in RAM, it'll be paged in through page faults, and committing it basically flush changes back to disk, kind of like MMAP on Unix. The interesting part of this is you can simply work with pointers from other programs like your own and hold onto them without worrying about them disappearing when the program dies. It changes how you think about buffers or even the difference between programs and processes. Think of the term orthogonal persistence. How is this even secure? I is probably the most popular example of a capability system in the wild. Each pointer is actually 128 bits, 64 bits of metadata, and 64 bits of address space. Outside of a pointer is a tag, which when written to invalidates the pointer. Since only trusted code in the kernel can generate the tags, they function effectively as capabilities. The tags are stored in ECC, uses some unfortunately undocumented PowerPC extensions to actually work. 
Using machine-independent bytecode is the other part of a security model. Since native programs aren't allowed, well, except outside of a native syscall emulator, but that's a long story, all programs get compiled to native code by the trusted translator in the kernel. This enforces the security model, like, say, how a JVM would work, but it's even allowed the transition from their custom sysc processors to PowerPC, and even allowed them to change the kernel ABI. We're going to show you a demo of some of the behind-the-scenes tools of IBM I. Unfortunately, a lot of this isn't too well documented because it's usually intended for IBM technicians, but we'll show you here. The next thing we're going to take a look at is SST, the System Service Tools. These provide some low-level insight to what's behind the curtain on IBM I. It's usually intended for technicians or people have to get information for technicians. So, we'll start it. It has its own separate credentials from the rest of the system because this is probably something you don't want to give people that don't need it. From this one, you can do things like work with disks or VMs that you might also have common use for. In this case, we're interested in the service tools. And the service tools, you get things like being able to trace the kernel, as they call it, license internal code in IBM speak, the kernel logs, kind of like a kernel syslog, the storage.manager, that's the crashes. But we're interested in particular is display ultra dump. This has a bunch of, of things like special commands, a hex editor that lets you look anywhere in memory, which is really interesting in the system with a single level store. And then and again, you can also take a look at some the structure of objects, which since this is in the bag of bytes system, but rather deals with structured objects, is again interesting. So we'll take a look. Display and ultra storage. The dump to printer is pretty much the same, except it'll just print out to a spool file or an actual printer if you have one. We'll take a look at an object. And we'll take a look at a program, which has some special support for. For a lot of these objects, it can display the actual structure, but in addition to the structure of a program, it can also display this assembly appended to it. So we'll do that. We know the name and context name. As the reason why it's called a context here is because libraries are built on lower level primitives called contexts. And we'll put in one of the programs that TQ wrote for Advent to Code. These are in COBOL, but it doesn't matter. They all compile to the same byte code. We'll enter the Advent 2020 library. See you there. I found it. That's who wrote it. And if we take a look at this assembled code, it would have the base structure stuff. But in addition, it's also got the disassembly to it. So a lot of this information, you'd pretty much have to work for IBM or follow, at least know a lot about the system to get a lot of it. But things like hex dumps, the actual base kind of structure, that's all pretty interesting. There's things like a string table, but we're also interested here is the actual disassembly. And see there, it looks like a normal PPC disassembly, except there's a bunch of weird instructions like set tag and TX air. So, as you can tell here, this probably isn't the PowerPC assembly that you're used to, even if you are used to PowerPC assembly. But, that's pretty interesting. Why don't we take a look at what the actual object looks like? So, I should have probably F12 here instead of F3, but it's nice enough to remember that. And we're going to go into the hex editor. This is capable of making alterations, but we probably don't want to do that. Here we just kind of want to scroll and actually take a look at things. But this assembler has some interesting features like being able to decode power PC instructions such as there. If you enter I there, it can also do things like follow pointers and such. But we're kind of done with that. Now let's take a look at a different kind of object. That's a little bit more interesting. We're going to take a look at a system entry point table. This is just basically a big list of pointers that point to basically the entry points of programs. Nothing too crazy, but it also has tags in it, which is going to be pretty interesting to see in the hex editor. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look for the spaceless kind of object. In this case is this object type 19 in hex. It's number 25 in the menu. We'll take a look at this, the object. We'll put in the name here. 
and it has a special su object subtype of C3. We need to know this because it doesn't really know how to deal with it otherwise. So it's found it. And we'll take a look at base structure. It's nothing too, too crazy here. Again, this would make more sense if you worked for IBM. So, we'll have 12 here, and we'll get into the hex editor. As you can see there, scroll down far enough. The, tag, the T here is for tag. And those are over there, just a button, bunch of pointers. So that's basically SST in a nutshell there. There's more service tools, but this kind of gets you sort of a good idea of what's behind the curtain, what's kind of not really well understood. But it would certainly help if you had to send it to IBM. Anyways, that's it for IBM I. We'd like to thank you for coming to the end of our vintage computing bullshit you can learn from session. But wait, we've got more. That's right, we do have more. In fact, you can try almost everything we've shown you at home. We've got some emulators here for Genera, Enterlisp, and it is possible to get your hands on Chokanji and run it in VMware. That's an exercise up to the reader, but you can probably find it if you look around. But unfortunately for IBM I, there's no emulator. And if anyone wants to rise up to the challenge, go right ahead. We would love to see it. And we also have some additional resources on Interlist, Vtron, Genera, and IBM I right here. And we also have an IBM I hobbyist Discord. We hate Discord too, but hey, it brought a bunch of enthusiasts out of the woodwork, so we can't complain. It's also bridged to an IRC channel for the traditionalists like us. And that's it, everyone. Thanks for your time. Hope you enjoyed watching our presentation. It was a quite fascinating talk. And um, I see why you called it uh, what we have lost, because, um, yeah, it's quite a lot that got lost on, in the progress of the uh, dominance of the PC. And, yeah, we got, a, we got some questions, actually. Um, and, yeah, I would just dive right into them if there is nothing you would like to add. TQ? Oh, yeah, nice oh. week. We got uh, the third one. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So someone in the IRC asked, uh, what does it mean for a computer to be a Lisp machine? So um, it's really, or to me, there's a couple of, there's two main points. First of all, uh, on a Lisp machine, the instruction set and entire system architecture is built around the idea of running Lisp. And so you had features like, garbage collection in microcode that uh, you had uh, har or you had hardware management of Lisp arrangement or list arrangement. So for example, uh, you could not tell from a, u a user perspective whether a list was stored as just contiguous cells of memory or an actual linked list. Uh, integers were all infinite precision. I think that I mentioned a that this caused problems for the C compiler because size of care was one and max care was infinity. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the other feature, though, which I think is more important, is that all of the software on the machine is running Lisp. There's no operating system underneath it written in C. There's or there's no assembly component. Component. It's all just, so if you want to replace the drivers for, or build a driver for some additional hardware that you've attached, you can do that entirely in Lisp. Oh, there's a tale from one of the Symbolics field engineers about the fact that at one point uh, they had a customer with a machine that was running very slowly and they couldn't figure it out. And it turned out that they had installed a patch which replaced a bunch of the drivers on the system and they never compiled that patch and so it was interpreting the driver code and it was slow yeah, but everything just worked operated on, on and yeah i think that's really the core of it words um what about interlist well 
I don't actually know that much about Enderlisp. You'd have to ask Tech Fury. Enderlisp, it seems, doesn't really do as much in uh, fancy hardware and microcode as Genera does. And I think a lot of this is because the hardware it ran on, the D-Machines, was really mainly meant to run Xerox's uh, Mesa virtual machine. And so they kind of just hacked Interlisp onto it by coming up with new microcodes. So I think they kind of just had to work within the constraints of that. So for the most part, you don't really see things like hardware garbage collection or rather microcode-based garbage collection. You do see the basics, though, like the fact, you know, like car and cons and such are all basically literally mapped directly to opcodes. That's probably the biggest thing I've noticed from digging into the D machines. Yeah, my impression is it's basically West Coast versus East Coast list machine. It's a big in Tupac of computer science. <laughs> well put, Calvin. Well put. All right. I think we have another question. Who still uses the Btron system? And the HTML export functionality seems semi-recent. So to my understanding, it's basically mostly a legacy platform at this point. It, as far as I understand, has a contingent of uh, academia users, mainly humanities, who tend to use it because it has better support for, shall we say, old slash deprecated kanji characters. And I think it's just kind of stuck with some of them through inertia mainly. And I believe the HTML export stuff showed up sometime around the turn of the century, give or take, probably when the uh, changeover to Btron 3 slash Bright V slash Chokanji, which would have been about 98, 99, 2000, give or take. So I think it's about when that ended up in there. All right. And it looks like our next question is, what's the most recent advanced or interesting list machine? What do you think, TQ? So the cheeky answer is Emacs. Oh. Uh, because... Yes, there is a C core to it, but all of the interface functionality and uh, all of the interaction is purely Lisp. Uh, the answer to the question that you were probably asking, though, is that there isn't really an answer. You've got the, uh, the genera side and the interlisp side don't really share any... Uh, they don't share a common ancestor. Uh, Lisp was very popular in academic and AI communities in the 80s and very early 90s. And so Symbolics commercialized the first Lisp machine, but Xerox came along and developed their own for, starting from scratch and came up with Interlisp. And the two we developed in parallel and didn't really cross-pollinate very much. So Interlisp is still maintained and it's worth using. And in particular, Interlisp can be used uh, co without any question about legality because it's all open source now. Yeah, the, uh, a VLM source is kind of floating around that the owner of rights is still unclear. Interlisp is explicitly free software now. And and one thing to add, I do find it amusing that both Interlisp and Genera share a, not really common ancestor, but a common sort of source platform of a PDP-10. Ah, uh, yes, the Lisp classic, the PDP-10. Ah, uh, the PDP-10 is a beautiful machine. I could give an entire talk on its instruction set. <laughs> right. Uh, equal bait. So it looks like our next question, is it really better to run the GC and microcode instead of normal code on, on an additional core? And that's a really good question, I think. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if the answer is that no, it's really not. I think that's just what made sense at the time because you have to remember at the time they were designing all this stuff, it was just trendy to do everything in microcode. I mean, look at the Xerox Alto. It basically bit bangs all its IO and microcode tasks. Much like a Cyrix it, Media GX came back. It's not, it's not just that it was trendy. At the time, in order to get decent performance running Lisp, you needed to do it in microcode because machines just weren't very fast. Right. And we didn't have pipelining. We didn't have the fast memory buses that we do now. Well, technically, you may have, but you had to buy like, like um, a Free60 Model 90 or a Cray 1 or something like that. So. Yeah. And there's no way that you could assign one of those to a single person. Nope. And the Cray probably wouldn't have been that great of an 
answer either because the Cray is really only designed for vector calculations. Exactly. So, uh, as it turns out, one of the big reasons that the Lisp machines died is that Franz Lisp ran fantastically on a Vax and would or, and didn't need any of the special hardware support that the Lisp machines offered. And then, and then basically, Risk Processors just put the final nail on the coffin. Yeah, and that's why the register machines really won, was they just got faster. And even, I think I recall reading that uh, for Xerox, Interlisp even, I think by about 87, a Sun 3 Model 60, which is a 20 megahertz Motorola 68020, was already faster than the D machines, <laughs> according to Xerox's own I mean, studies, you, apparently. I mean, pretty much every rich environment that didn't die got reported to it, basically risk or something sufficiently risk like under the like yeah. I got rebased onto PowerPC. Um, I, as you know, Interlist actually sort of got a second life running on Sparks. And Genera Interlist did. And yeah, Genera ran on alphas. But we live. Don't worry, we're living the ARM future again. Interlist still runs on ARM. So I thought this next question was really interesting. What extensions would be required to a normal issue? Risk design to improve Lisp throughput and/or latency. Hmm. Huh. I guess you could right. add like a, I guess you could add like memory tagging, like a, one IBM has would actually probably work well for Lisp. That's a good point. Memory tagging would be cool. Point. Yeah, some uh, logs did that. I think the, the memory tagging. I think the memory tagging extensions for ARM. And the ARM are only really good for security because they're basically more pointer signing. I think. The Spark right. ones I don't know much about, but I think they're intended for JVMs. So yeah, this would work. The Spark instruction set or the Spark extensions, as I understand, were actually specifically designed for Lisp. They give you two additional tag bits for types really? oh, and thought, arithmetic instructions. I thought they were more that designed will, for the JVM. I, I believe that they tr the arithmetic instructions trap if the tag bits aren't the same for two pointers, and so you can just do fix. You can pretend that everything's a fixed up, mm. and handle it if it's not. Yeah, I guess that, that, sounds totally, that sounds like it would work for a JVM, but what works for a JVM would probably work for a Lisp. Uh, yeah, I do, and, then, and what's little known about the IBM extensions, all they really do is there's no hardware enforcement, rather it's just like acceleration for basically software-based checks. So actually one feature that's uh, surprisingly good but it is surprising at accelerating uh, Lisp, Lisp code is floating or IEEE floating point uh, hmm. look into NAN boxing if you haven't because it is I've it heard about NAN boxing yeah yeah it turns out that you can store pointers and most types in the unused bits in a, not a number and <laughs> Um, They'll trap if you try to add two things that are numbers. Oh my god, and singling. Yeah. Dangerous. <laughs> oh god, that's cursed, but I like it. Right. It is. Um, yeah, so I'm afraid we'll have to um, cut it a bit here because um, we're running a bit short in time. No worries. Um, so there are... Um, Two questions left, um, and one personal remark. Um, yeah, uh, the one, the first one is um, if the Bitcoin situ situation um, is similar to what happened to OS 2s respectively, Ecom Station. So I'm not sure if you can really draw an analogy there because Ecom Station is kind of a, uh, if I recall correctly, the whole arrangement with Ecom Station is that it's a OEM distribution of OS2, but it's a little bit different with Btron because Btron is an open specification that realistically only one vendor really made implementations yeah, of personal it, imagine, media. Imagine, imagine if basically there's only a single POSIX implementation standing. That's basically it. What he said. So, and um, I think someone asked, uh, when are you going to give a uh, talk on the PDP-10? Maybe next year? Oh, yeah. Hopefully. That's, that's, 
I think that was then quite easy to answer. And someone personally remarked that uh, they have a 60-page paper on the on the Tron in case in case someone was listening on the IRC. Um, but it's in German, so yeah. If you speak still German, read it. Uh, maybe this person can. Uh, huh? Maybe this person will be <laughs> will suit your needs. <laughs> Um, also, um, there was the request from the IRC to um, to the speakers to maybe hang around a bit longer in the IRC oh, to um, to answer any yeah, additional questions there because we sadly have to end the talk as your time slot. So yeah, uh, thank you, thank you for taking the time to prepare all this. Thank you for joining us from such remote locations. Thank you for. Um, <laughs> Standing up early or or late. Well, it's really early for us, so. Yeah, so thank you very much for that and have a nice uh, remote chaos experience. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you for your thank you. talk. <laughs>